And um, we haven't said this yet this morning, but for you that are, have joined us via the live stream media, we welcome you today to Orchard Assembly and our Mother's Day 2024 celebration. You know, when, when our children were babies and toddlers and things, I would watch Miss Jenny, and my question was always this, how did she know what to do? You know? I just, I could never figure it out. And then when she, whatever she did, it worked. I think, how did she know to do that? I mean, I've answered the call of the cry, and it didn't get better. And yet when she answered the call, it got better. Well, I think I've learned the secret. All I heard was the cry. She heard their voice. Moms hear the voice of their children not just their cry. Boy, I think that's special about moms. I really do. I, I, I know uh, in some churches we've been in there, the nursery was just right off of the, the sanctuary, and every once in a while, occasionally, you would hear a, a baby cry, and always the right mother got up and went back there. And not, and they didn't all jump up at the same time, but the right mom went back because they didn't just hear the cry, they heard the voice. So I begin my message this morning to all moms, and I say to each of you, if I haven't gotten to you this morning, happy Mother's Day to you, and I trust that you will be blessed by God as you have entered this sanctuary, and that you will know that his presence is guiding you through all of your efforts and endeavors as a mom. My mom has been gone from this earth for just a little over six years, and I admit to you this morning, I still miss her. But I know she's in heaven. I don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us, but I wonder if they celebrate Mother's Day up in heaven. Possible. And what we've tried to do a little bit here this morning is just to make sure that we were honoring each of our moms that are present in this church family. And, you know, the reality is, is we should bless moms everywhere. Let me, let me begin with something that's real obvious. The truth is that none of us would be here today if it had not been for a mom. I told you it was obvious. And further, few of us what may not be in church if it hadn't been for a mom, a natural mom, a birth mom, an adoptive mom, or a spiritual mom. I find my, myself on Mother's Day always with an extremely difficult task to preach to moms and to address a subject that, to be honest with you, I really don't know and understand. Now, I admit to you that I don't know how moms think, but I know they do. You know how I know? Ever tried to pull one over on them? Words like can't, not, kind of come to my mind. And I'm going to draw your attention this morning to the mother of Jesus for our thoughts for this morning. Mary had been given the responsibility of raising the Son of God. In essence, Mary was the earthly mother of God. If you think you have a difficult task in raising your children, think about the task she was given. Now, I want you to go with me to Matthew's Gospel, the first chapter this morning. We're going to read verses 18 21 and 23, and if you can stand, I will ask you to do that this morning as we read the word. Verse 18 says this in chapter number one of the book of Matthew. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then down to verse number 21. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then down to verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. The Christ had come to earth. Let's pray together. Father, thank you this morning for sending your son. Thank you, Father, for the mom that you chose 
as she is an example for all of us. And Lord, I thank you today that you will bless this time as we look into your word. And Lord, I thank you this day that the anointing of the Holy Spirit will be upon this message. May it be an encouragement to our moms as well as a challenge. And I give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And you may be seated. And thank you again for, for standing. The story of Jesus, Emmanuel, begins with an angel speaking to a woman by the name of Mary. And he spoke to her about becoming a mom, perhaps the greatest commission for evangelism and discipleship on the planet is about mom. God had chosen Mary to be Jesus' earthly mom. In Luke chapter 1, verse 38, we, we have Mary's reply to the announcement of God choosing her. She said, Behold the maid servant of the Lord. What an attitude she had. Let it be unto me according to your word. This is an attitude of all attitudes. There was a total submission of Mary to God's plan, God's purpose, and God's path for her life. Then if you look over at Luke chapter number 2 and verse 19, this scene is after the shepherds have visited the stable and they have told Mary and Joseph about how the angels came and sang about his birth and announcing Emmanuel's or Jesus' birth. And here's my point of uh, bringing that scripture to you. Mary kept all these things and she pondered them in her heart. Don't you just wonder what was going on in Mary's heart and mind in the stable that night? I do. It was dawning upon her. She is the mom of the Messiah. He was and is the Son of God. And it begs the question, how do you raise this child who is the Son of God? Mary undoubtedly deserves a special place among women. Mary is the earthly mother of the Son of God, Emmanuel. And let's not forget that this son of Mary's, while he was totally man, he was also totally God. In a wonderful way, Mary speaks to all of us, and especially to moms. Because every child you have is totally human. But they are all a creation of God. C.M. Ward, the great radio evangelist of revival time, said this, and, and I quote, Every mom dreams that her son will excel. She believes her trip to the edge of death will fully be redeemed by the success of her son, unquote. The account of Jesus, the Christ, begins with an angel who was sent, and he spoke to Mary about becoming a mom. I, I want to spend a, a few moments this morning looking around that particular thought and what the lessons is that we can learn from Mary in regards to raising children. I think most of us would admit it's hard work. Okay, I'm the only one that felt that way. Isn't raising children hard work? It did, go like this, okay? It's hard work, but it's worth it, isn't it? Hmm. Let me say this also. All mothers are noble. Therefore, they are to be treated with utmost care and honor. God choosing Mary is proof that God uses women in his plan, his purpose, and his path. In all the plan of God as it's laid out for us in Scripture for mankind, was there any more important task than Mary becoming the mother of the Son of God? God saw, Mary, or saw in Mary qualities absolutely necessary to be the mother of his only son. Well, what kind of woman would God have choose? What qualities were demanded? Number one, I believe she knew God through his word. I believe that she had hidden the word of God into her herself, and the word was a part of her being. It was because of the source of that, that the purity which set Mary apart. She rejoiced in God. There is no fear visible as she receives the message that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. 
The word was so in her that she understood that it meant that the Holy Spirit coming up, what it meant for the Holy Spirit to come upon a person. And the power of the highest will shall overshadow you. Because of the word in her, she could say, I'm going to live under the protection of the Holy Spirit in life. That's a place to be. She welcomed the, the promise of the Holy Spirit and his power to be upon her. With simple faith, she accepts the wondrous mystery rejoicingly. The words she spoke in response was, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord. She was totally surrendered and committed to the Lord. And she said, Be it according to thy word. Mary, I believe, was a woman of the book. She was a, a woman of, of the Bible. God's word was the supreme authority in her life. And even though her life and her plans could have been destroyed, she said, yes, Lord. The victory of obedience and submission to God's will, the plan, purpose, and path, brought a song. In fact, she, she so rejoiced in the Lord that she sang. My soul does magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. She magnified the Lord, not herself. Mary became a mother. Nobility was thrust upon her. In the same, on that same note, her gracious humility sweetens her song. As she thinks of her lowly estate and how wondrous that God should come to her, a poor peasant maiden. You see, this is such a picture of worship. So number two, she was not only a woman of the word, but she was a mom who worshiped. Mary was a worshiper of God. That is what made Mary nobility. See, not just being the mother of God's son, but that she was a worshiper. We are not nobility because we have children. What makes us co-heirs with Christ a nobility is our relationship to Christ. And our covenant relationship is what causes us to have this fellowship and this worship in our lives. These two things moms can bring into their home. A love for the word of God. Your nobility as a mother is not in having children. It is in your relationship to the word of God. God because through knowing the word you get to know God and can you as a mom do better than introducing your children through the word to the king of kings and the lord of lords another things mom bring into the house being worshipers what a head start a child receives when there's a spiritual environment in the home then it really doesn't matter whether you were born in a stable and reared in a carpenter shop. For nobility isn't about swimming pools or expensive cars. It isn't about living in a restricted, exclusive section of town. It's not in getting a superior education. It's in the soul. Nobility is Christ in the soul. We have, we have nothing without Christ in us. And the greatest accomplishment in life is for our children to be raised and to serve Christ. What Bonaparte said to France is universally true. He said, what France needs is mothers. I would say to my nation, the United States of America, what the United States needs is mothers who know the Bible and are worshipers. What, what makes for a good mother anyway? I mean, patience, compassion, broad hips, the, the ability to nurse a baby, cook dinner, and sew a button on a shirt all at the same time? Or is it your heart after God's word and being a worshiper? What a difference when the source of our children's training comes from the word of God and through a worshiper of God. That's what's lacking in America. 
We can, we can blame it on all the politicians. We can blame it on all, 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 all the, the, the junk that's being taught in public schools and all that other stuff. We can blame it all on that. But the truth of the matter is, is what's lacking in America is moms who are teaching their children the word of the living God at home. And, and can I, as long as I'm on a soapbox here, let me just continue for a moment. Don't put all of the training of your children to happen in the church. We only get them an hour or maybe two at the very most throughout the whole week. But you got them the whole time. And it's time for moms to stand up and say, you know what? In our house, this is the way we live because this is what the book says. Amen, amen. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. You see, it is the Word of God that will keep you. It transforms our minds, it cleans our soul, it purifies our heart, and it humbles our spirit. That's the kind of equal opportunity that will redeem this nation and make it great. Let me inject a, 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 another subject here. I'm going to shift gears. If you have a really gifted child, don't spoil them. by bragging on their gifts. If your child has been born with a halo and wondrous visions, marvelous foreshadow of coming events, gifts from wise men from distant lands, prophecies from saints for future greatness, would you have kept all these things to yourself? Would you have just pondered these things in your heart? But the record says of Mary that she kept all of these things and pondered them in her heart. In other words, she did not reduce Joseph, her husband, nor her six children to neglect because she had Jesus. Her mother's pride never unsealed her womanly silence. Perhaps she felt that these things were too great, too awesome, and too overshadowing her, her child's boyhood. She felt perhaps also that she would expose him to the envy and even the hatred of less gifted brothers and sisters. Most likely, she, because she knew the word, she would not repeat Rebecca's folly with Isaac toward Joseph. Her dreams would have been to choose for him success, not failure, wealth, not sacrifice, a crown, not a cross. So she waited, knowing that God's plan purpose and path would come to him in God's own time. So she kept all these things and she pondered them in her heart. I believe moms carry many things in their heart towards their children. And I believe that Mary let Jesus grow up as a child, just as she did in James and Jude and, and, and Simeon and or Simon and, and Joseph and Jesus' sisters. The Bible says that she let him grow and wax strong in spirit, and he increased in wisdom and stature and in the favor of God and man. Mary cultivated her children. She stirred them to grow up in the favor of God. Part of the task of motherhood is not for the child to be spoiled, but to train, discipline them in the use of their gifts for God's service. That was always my mom's prayer. My mom never prayed that her sons would be preachers, just that they would grow up and serve the Lord with whatever capacity he called them to. It's not by accident that both my brother and I ended up in the ministry full time. See, Mary was at the cross. She saw the full plan, purpose, and path of God for his son. Perhaps a part of her greatness is that Mary was a woman of prayer. Mary can, she can challenge us to be people of prayer. When, when you walk around the house all night with a baby, you just can't seem to get to, to, to quit crying, keep praying. When you're sitting in the carpool line, keep praying. When your children are gone astray, keep praying. When you step into a messy room, Keep praying. When you, when you are reduced to tears over something they've done or said, keep praying. My mom, I really do believe this, seemed to understand the principle of understanding that my brother and I had ideals and aspirations. 
When I was first involved in the racetrack ministry, there was a lot of criticism that came my way. In fact, I had one preacher tell me, why in the world would you go to the racetrack? All they got there is people who are drinking, smoking, and cussing. I thought, well, man, that's where I really need to be. And I think Jesus would probably visit there. So I thought I was in pretty good company. But it was my mom that, that, that finally said to me one day, she said this. She said, not everyone would be willing to go down and shake hands with people who have grease all over their hands. Boy, that was an encouraging word to my, my day. I still look back on the years of ministry at the racetrack and marvel at the impact God allowed me at racetracks. It's possible that which your children have an interest in can become the very ministry that God would use them in to bring people to Christ. Mary didn't always rise to the occasion. She was just as human as you and me. Do you remember this part of, of the story? When Jesus was 12 years old, he had been missing for several days. Man, if we lose track of our child in, in Walmart, one aisle, we're, there's a little bit of panic that's going on inside of our life. Can you imagine being three days without knowing where he was? And when she finds him, here, here's, here's the real mom. She finds him and says, son, can't you just hear that? Son, why have you dealt with us? Your father and I have sought you sorrowing. Did she forget who he was? There's another example at the wedding of Cana. She, she comes to him and she's, she has these words. She says, they're out of wine. Now, you know my imagination. She didn't come to him and just say, now, honey, they're out of wine and I need you to do something. No, it was, they're out of wine. And then she, then she gets pushy. She doesn't wait for him to even answer. She just said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Mary jumped the gun, as some moms are tempted to do, in showing off her son. But what is needed is to stay in step with what God is doing in their children. Something was happening in Mary's child to her child that she did not recognize nor perhaps realize at the moment. Children really do grow up fast. My mom used to say, you should enjoy these years because they're going to go by very quick. In a blink of an eye, they'll be gone. And I'd look at her and I'd blink. I said, no, mom, they're still here. But understand this. God is working something in their lives. He's developing something. And sometimes we don't always recognize what God is doing. When we moved to this part of the country and we were living in Pascagoula and we were at a new church and, and our son was of age, our oldest son was of age to go to, to, to a youth group and they were going to, off to a, a kind of a, what do I want to call it? They were going off to Florida. And they were, it, it was just a, a kind of a retreat type of thing for the group. And my son did not want to go. I mean, talk about heels in the ground, okay? And here's his mom dragging him to get on the bus. She's right here. She can tell you I'm not exaggerating. She was dragging him to get on that bus. You're going. It's either this or death, but you're going. No, she didn't. Try. And he went so upset but one night around the fireplace God spoke to him and said I'm calling you to be a minister and my son today my oldest son today pastors a church in Mississippi God we never know when God's going to work something in their lives and he's working something See, to keep in stride with, with your children when they're seven is a task. To keep in touch with them when they're 14 is almost impossible. And they venture then into adulthood, and it's overwhelming. And yet, on top of all of that, you still are mom. So the challenge is, don't lose contact with what God is developing in them. 
Mary would never forget the jewels of spices and the adoration of his, at his birth. But it was difficult to conceive the spittle and the rejection, the thorns and the scorn and the beatings that he would be his destiny. When he, was, when he was pierced in his side by the sword, it must have felt like she was being pierced. That would have been the greatest difficulty of mothers is to watch their children die. But it would be misguided love that would attempt to keep a child from their mission, from the shame, but also from their glory. And Mary was left with a mother's grief for she, had, she, had, she would rather have chosen for her child notoriety versus scorn, reception versus rejection, and glory and not a cross. But she, nor can you, tie your children to your apron strings, but rather tie into their ideals, their aspirations, and their calling. For at age 30, Jesus walked away from that carpenter shop and headed for the cross. At age 33, yes, she was there at the foot of the cross. And I shall always love this part of the deal. She knew the full revelation of his life had come to pass. Again, she knew the strength of silence. There was no complaint. There was no upbraiding of God. There was no fussing over man. She was connected to God's plan, his purpose, and his path for her son all the way from birth to death. The comfort was to come in the resurrection. And in the Pentecost, the infilling and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit had, and she and her family, I believe, were among the 120. It was complete vindication, for she had come to that place where she is forever her Lord's. You know, words to a song say, that child that you delivered will soon deliver you. For that sleeping child you held in the stable is the great I am. He is the Lord of all creation, and one day he will rule the nations. Oh, we can hear the echo of her song down through the ages. My soul doth magnify and rejoice in the Lord my God and my Savior. Let me wrap this up. This is something I've noticed about all moms. Moms do the best job they know how. And I say that because every child is different. And none of them come with a manual. Even if in, your, in, in the eyes of others she, she, you don't measure up, you're still doing the best job you know how. Keep at it. I know on, a, on that occasion like Mary, you might have missed a beat or a step. But thank you for being there. Thank you for looking for us when we were lost. Thank you when, we didn't, when you didn't understand our ideals for being there. Thank you for understanding that God created me the way I am. Thank you for understanding for the discipline that you showed that you cared and that you loved me. Some of you moms have served God all of your lives. And some of you moms that are here today, you, you ha wish that you would have served God all of your lives. But either way, no matter which group you are in, you are proud of your children and even those who are not saved. And I say to you this morning, good for you. Let me draw us to an altar this morning. Let, let me speak to moms who wish that they had served God all of their lives first. Especially if you're blaming yourself for the fact that one or all of your children aren't serving God. And you've been thinking, boy, if I had just been saved earlier, or if, if I hadn't let this happen in my life, uh, maybe my, my children would be saved too. I'm saying to you this morning, give yourself forgiveness just as God has forgiven you, keep praying, keep believing God's word, and keep worshiping. Then to the moms who have lived for God all of your life, and you too may have a child or children who aren't serving the Lord, 
Perhaps you've beaten yourself up oh, about it. You even blamed yourself for it and you tried to figure out what did I do wrong or how did I, how did I miss this or whatever. And I want to say to you, moms, this morning also, forgive yourself as God has forgiven you. Keep praying, keep believing, and keep worshiping. You see, the reason we can't forgive ourselves and ask for forgiveness is that it's not our responsibility for our children to get saved. See, unless you originated from heaven in a virgin birth and you came to earth to die for your children's sin and rose again, you're not responsible for your, your children's salvation. Yes, we're par as parents, we are responsible for training them in the way that they should go, and we have a responsibility to teach them of God, to help them understand God's plan and purpose and path for their life, and to live before them as Christians' example. But each child has a responsibility for his or her own salvation. Every child, same as you, was born with a sinful nature of their own. And as such, they are responsible for what they are going to do about Jesus and the salvation he provides. Truth is, is all of us in here are children. Hmm. All of different ages. Not one of us could blame our lack of our salvation on our parents. Hmm. Or not being saved. Whether she's the very best mom that the world could ever have, or even maybe she's the worst mom ever. Each of us has to make our own decision for Christ. As much as my mom loved the Lord, as much as my mom knew the word, and I can, I can assure you this morning that my mom was such a student of this Bible that both my brother and I, when we'd come to a passage of Scripture that we may wanted to preach or we, and we weren't sure exactly what, what, what the interpretation would be, either one of us would call our mom and say, hey, what about this verse? And our mom would say, hey, this is what I studied, and this is what God showed me. And as much as I know my mom's in heaven today, I can't get there on her salvation. I have to have my own. Amen. So it brings us to a point of decision this morning. What are you going to do about Jesus? Mom, what have you done about Jesus? Child, teenager, Young adult, what have you done about Jesus? See, I ask that question because you know the Scripture says that it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. That judgment is going to be about one thing. What did you do about Jesus? It's going to have nothing to do with the fact that I've preached for 40 years. That has nothing to do with getting me into heaven. It doesn't have anything to do with you were a good businessman or you were a smart lady or you're a Proverbs 30, 31 woman. It had nothing to do with that. What did you do about Jesus? And your answer and my answer will determine where we're going to spend eternity. For either we turned to Jesus and repented and was washed in the blood and our name is written in the Lamb's book of life, or we rejected Jesus as our Savior. What will your answer be? I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads as you stand as well. Right where you are this morning. You may be watching via media. You may be sitting in your car or sitting in your living room or your office. Or you might be sitting or standing right here in this sanctuary. You can ask for forgiveness any place and repent and receive Christ as your Savior. I want to pray a prayer, but I want you to follow me and I want you to pray it as well this morning. So begin, Lord Jesus, I come to you this morning. 
I acknowledge that I need a Savior. I realize this morning that Jesus is the only Savior. I repent of my sin. I turn to you as my Savior. I renounce all other gods and will from this day forward endeavor to live my life for you. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for accepting me. Thank you for cleansing me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning, whether that was for a salvation for you, or maybe it was just you've been beating yourself up or the devil's been beating you up because you feel like you made some mistakes. You just asked him to wash you clean of that mistake. And he did. If you meant it, he did. So I want to I wanna challenge you with a couple of things before we close this morning. This Number one is this. Start reading your Bible every day. And can I encourage you to read it out loud. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word of God. And it, no, better, no better witness of what the word says than when it comes from your own lips. Don't start reading Revelation. People get saved, they immediately want to go to the book of Revelation. Mark, Psalms, Proverbs, those are good books to get started in. Then number two, pray every day. Include worship in that prayer time. In fact, I would recommend you start with worship and then go to prayer. Number three, attend church meetings. We invite you to join us here. Number four, make yourself accountable to someone who will mentor you. Somebody, in other words, find somebody more spiritual than you and hang around with them. I've learned in my life that the people who are truly spiritual, they let me into their world. Those that think they're spiritual, they don't. But the people who are really spiritual, they'll let me in even though I'm not up to their level. But boy, when they rub off on me, I grow. And number five, share with others your decision to walk and live for Jesus. I'm not going to walk in any more condemnation. Whatever mistakes I've made, guess what? They're in the past. They're behind you. We just prayed together this morning, put it all behind us, and we're starting fresh this morning and walking with God. And I'd even say this, if you need further help beyond what we're talking about here this morning, you can feel free to contact me. I'll even give you my phone numbers. 251-689-7872. Give me a call. I'll be glad to help you in your walk with God. And I know there's others in this church that will as well. Remember this this morning, church. The best is yet to come. I guess you didn't hear me. The best is yet to come. I'm going to try it one more time. The best is yet to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, this morning, we have prayed a prayer, Father, to forgive us for our past, all of our failures as moms, as dads. Lord, things that we didn't put together all the right way, but Lord, we prayed and asked for your forgiveness this morning. Lord, there may even be somebody in this sanctuary this morning who prayed the prayer of salvation for their own soul. And they, Father, were asking for forgiveness. Lord, I pray right now that you will, through the Holy Spirit, you'll make it real to them that they were forgiven by you. So, Lord, I thank you that even though today we're, right now, we're dismissing our service, we're not being dismissed from your presence, and your presence is going with us. So we give you thanks for that this morning. And, Lord, I just pray for your blessing to be upon every mom Every mom, Lord, bless them in their efforts for all of their life, Father, their mom. That never goes away just because we grew up. So, Lord, I pray that you'll encourage every mom in being a mother. And I give you thanks now in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.